Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Centre for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of the CG Signature Lecture Series. And I'd also like to thank the Balsley School of International Affairs for co-sponsoring tonight's event. Thanks also to you for joining us here, whether you're uh, part of the live audience here in the CG Auditorium, or if you're joining us through the webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences at the microphones here at the front of the auditorium, or if you're watching online, then through the uh, live chat function on your screen. Please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. The terror generated by the Islamic State, or ISIS, is keeping Middle East politics on the front pages of television and uh, front pages of newspapers and on TV news lineups of Western media and all around the world, and causing many of us to wonder what might lead to progress in the cause of peace in that region. Tonight's speaker, Michael Bell, has views on whether the West can or cannot help to resolve the dysfunctions of international affairs and, in, and multilateral relations in the Middle East, views that are deeply informed by his own extensive diplomatic experiences in the region. And here to more properly introduce tonight's speaker is a local expert and researcher into transnational relations in the Middle East, Dr. Jasmine Habib. Jasmine is Associate Professor at the Balsley School of International Affairs and in the Department of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Habib. Hello and welcome to our uh, evening event. I'm pleased to introduce tonight uh, my, uh, Michael Bell. Many of you will recognize him as someone who's written op-ed articles for the Globe and Mail. He's also uh, published an article in Foreign Affairs. Michael Bell is a senior fellow at Carleton University where he teaches at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. He began in 1975 and right through to 2003, he held positions as, the ambas as Canada's ambassador to Jordan, Egypt, and Israel three times over. He has also served as a representative to the Palestinians through, or actually in the post-Oslo period. He has been the High Commissioner to Cyprus. He was the chair of the Donor Committee of the International Reconstruction Fund Facility of Iraq, and has also uh, held the position as an arms inspector for UNSCUM in Iraq early in the mid-90s. From 2005 to 2013, he was the Paul Martin Senior Senior Scholar in International Diplomacy at the University of Windsor, where he currently holds the position of adjunct professor. He is co-chair of the Jerusalem Old City Initiative, designed to develop options for the governance of the Old City, and he tells me that there's a three-volume publication that they hope will be published by Routledge sometime in 2015 or 2016, and I'm sure all of us would welcome to see that publication out. I will look forward as well to the talk tonight, along with all of you. He will be speaking on liberal attitudes and Middle East realities. Please join me in welcoming Michael Bell. Well, good evening. I am, I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight. I'll just get myself set up here. And um, I hope that I have some comments and views that may be of use to you as we look at this seemingly insoluble problem of the outrageous that are now a daily occurrence in the, in the Middle East. I want to tell you that I've put this PowerPoint together merely as a, an introduction to show you or to situate you in terms of the realities as they are and to use that as a framework for the approach I'm going to take in uh, speaking to you. So I'm just going to flip through these and uh, give you the vis visual images that I think are necessary to, as a, as a learning aid, to consider more fully the realities. <clears throat> 
And I call this series of slides the Middle East Cataclysm. Just a general map of, of the Middle East showing you Syria, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the rest to situate yourself. This is a map of Syria, which shows the location of opposition forces, forces of ISIS, the Islamic State, of the Kurds, of the Syrian Armed Forces, and what have you, to give you a pretty good idea, I think, of how fragmented and fragile this very uh, desperate situation is. Just some images now of the things that we have seen in this region in uh, recent months. Maybe that perhaps is the most moving image that I've seen. And we'll come back to uh, Syria. Now, this presentation is not going to be uh, a particularly hopeful one. You might be uh, looking for that. But if I were to offer it, I would be dishonest. So please be prepared for a fair degree of bad news. I've tried to assess the reasons for it, why it's likely to persist. And at the end, I'll have a few thoughts on what might actually be done about it by countries in the West, for instance as well as uh, regional partners that have a degree of stability and predictability that obviously Syria, Iraq, and uh, their neighbors do not. So let me begin. It's traditions of colonialism, autocracy, clientelism, corruption, alienation, and imagined history which can tribute to the dysfunction of Middle East polities. Imagine history is what the players or the victims, those living there, those part of, 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 of Middle Eastern communities believe happened, which can be quite a different thing than what actually happened. I think we can characterize the Middle East as an intricate mix of authoritarianism, ethno-nationalism, and ideological belief systems, three factors. And these are the ones that dominate Arab politics today. Authoritarianism, ethno-nationalism, and ideological belief systems. Probably it's most strikingly manifest in the images and the knowledge we acquire about the Islamic State organization, or ISIS. But it would be wrong to see this as a simple one-off event, because the causes of this dysfunction are, are much, much deeper. I can say that the authoritarianism and the authoritarian one-party state system of Saddam Hussein, of Haifa Assad, and others of that ilk crushed pluralistic development. They suppressed the possibility that individuals and communities might express themselves openly, realize their rights and freedoms, and determine their own futures. They failed to meet the basic aspirational, social, political, and economic needs of their peoples. In other words, they were devoid of legitimacy. They weren't viewed by their populations as legitimate governors. The result is the chaos that we witness today, where personal fears have driven people to their primordial, their very deepest identities, and to radical ideologies that offer them some hope, they think, of redemption. 
For instance, Iraqi freedoms were checked ruthlessly by the Saddam Hussein regime, which was overthrown by the American invasion of 2003. Now, American neoconservatives at the time did not see the Middle East as a series of collectivities based on primal needs, but their invasion was such a shock to the Iraqi system that it caused the breakup of the Iraqi state system. And such disaggregation, such collapse, if you like, of state systems spread throughout the Arab region via, ironically, the Arab Spring, whose noble aspirations were in turn subsumed by ethno-nationalism, again, and ideology, Absent any inclusive political or social culture, what, what bound Syrians together? What bound Iraqis together? Many Arab activists were young, middle class, supported by the intelligentsia, who had the energy and street level legitimacy to drive the despot from power. In other words, they were seen as, as legitimate players, welcomed by many, as liberating. Maybe this was most evident in terms of television coverage in, in Egypt. It was these youth who were the drivers of change, and they had widespread support among the disenfranchised, poverty-stricken, and alienated. So it wasn't just ideas that drove people. The bulk of the population, the peasant population, the underprivileged, were driven by economic need as well, which one can never underestimate in such countries. But the, uh, the purported liberators lacked experience and the organizational depth necessary to sustain their enterprise. In other words, they came to power but they didn't know what to do with it. They were swept aside. And despite their yearning for a pluralistic government system, there's little evidence positive change is possible, in my view, in the foreseeable future. Such are the dynamics unleashed by the bloodshed we witness. Most likely, I say here, and I think it's, it is the case, change will be multi-generational. What I mean by that is it's going to be very hard to predict when the situation will change. It's certainly a distant goal um, and harder still to determine what we can do about it. While a majority of Arabs support the concept of democracy, polling indicates that they, those polled, those representative of Arab populations, do not believe that this democracy should deviate from their own sociocultural norms. As well, they increasingly appear to question whether democracy is appropriate for their particular situation, given their yearning for security in the, work, in the wake of the current crisis. So they want what we would broadly called democracy, but they want it to reflect a set of values uh, that we might define as narrow or constraining. And furthermore, they don't think that democracy is suitable for them, the Kuwaitis, the Egyptians, whoever, right now. And throughout my time in the Middle East, in much more Pacific times, I would hear this refrain constantly. Yes, democracy is the ideal, but we're not ready for it. So what can outsiders do about it? Probably not much. I do have a few ideas that I'm going to share with you at the end of this presentation. But our mistake in the past has been that we've been reluctant to consider innate behavioral modes. We preferred to think that there are certain rules, regulations, norms, belief systems that are applicable to all peoples. 
But very often what we assume to be normal is at variance with the values held in the Arab world. So that our, ex our efforts to export Western values, think back to the invasion of Iraq by George W. Bush, and the practices within what we often deem less advanced polities can be labeled cultural imperialism. In other words, we know what's right, we'll tell you how to do it, and once you learn how to do it, you will, you will embrace it. That did not happen. So our efforts failed. That doesn't invalidate the role of the West, but ethnicity and dogma have become governing realities in the Middle East, no matter how uncomfortable we find that. So for Western policies, policymakers rather, what I would call sober realism needs to be the watch phrase. What can be done rather than what should be done. We all know what should be done in our own minds, what we think should be done. But can it be done? Is it feasible? Is it realistic? That's what counts. Because in the Middle East, the pull of identity is the essence of reality. Now, autocrats in the Middle East who have and continue to eschew responsibility uh, allow no space for societal or political transformation, and hence the chaos that we see today. Rather, their, their regimes, these authoritarian regimes, were based on a manipulation of culture and identity, equating diversity with heresy. In other words, if you weren't lo loyal to a certain belief system, or you weren't loyal to a certain ruling clique, you were a heretic. Now, significant growth in the authority and pervasiveness of the state system became a dominant characteristic of the post-independent Arab world, built on what I would call a paternalistic despotism bequeathed by the Ottoman Empire. In other words, the Ottomans were no Democrats, but they, they were very loose in their control, giving communities and social groups considerable freedom for the time to manage their own affairs. What happened, though, when the authoritarians came to power was that all these self-governance mechanisms had dissipated, had disappeared. So that when the regimes like Saddam Hussein's in Iraq were overthrown, it created a power vacuum. In the late 19th and early 20th century, with the impending collapse of the Ottomans, concepts of Arab nationalism writ large came to the fore. In other words, what was important was the idea of being an Arab, that somehow Arabness would solve problems by giving uh, the residents of that area, Muslim, Christian, what have you, a sense of common linguistic and uh, eth ethno ethnological identity. However, the uh, peacemakers of 1919 sitting in Paris didn't have much time for that, intent as they were to carve up the region to suit their own imperial interests. Then, in the 60s and thereafter, we had a resurgence of this pan-Arab spirit, if you like, by Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt and by the Ba'ath Party in Damascus. In other words, Stressing again, Arab unity is the solution. Didn't work. So the withdrawal of the uh, imperial powers 
who had the strength to hold together these artificial, I would say, entities such as Syria and Iraq, made fertile grounds for authoritarian rule. And the security services, the armed forces, and, and the regime's political agency, that is the party, became the dominant institutions in the, Arab, in the world of Arab politics. That happened elsewhere in the uh, third world at the time. But for some reason, while other areas were able to transform themselves, the authoritarian mode stuck in the Middle East. This reflected the iron rule of Middle Eastern despots who relied on the manipulation of their families, their tribe, their nation, and their ideology or belief system to hold power. And they, as long as they were able, enforced stability through the suppression of dissent in virtually any form and by any means. So this authoritarianness fostered corruption and clientelism. Um, triumph, Transparency International, rather, for instance, cites Iraq as the fourth most corrupt country on the globe. How can you develop a society, a pluralistic civil society, when corruption becomes the leaf motif of the regime. So that civil society, because it implied pluralism, the ability of groups and ethnicities to express themselves differently, became anathema in authoritarian eyes. Now, what happened with the imperial presence was Syria was just arbitrarily carved up as was Iraq. So it didn't matter whether you were an Alawite, a Sunni Muslim, a Shia Muslim, et cetera, et cetera, a Druze, a Christian, or what have you. These sociological communities were ignored. So the European peacemakers sitting in Paris were unaware and uncaring. If you read Mar Mar Margaret Macmillan's book, Paris, 1919, you will understand the depth of the ignorance of those that were making the decisions about the future of this region. And it can be best illustrated, for instance, by Winston Churchill's aphorism that he had created Jordan in a single day at the 1921 Cairo conference, sealed by the stroke of his pen. So they created a series of fragile state structures, ignoring community, identity groups, most markedly Sunni and Shia, in both their societal and political context. And these were communities which saw themselves as nations, sharing a common culture, a narrative, descent, and language. They became, in a sense, stateless. So that's why today, when you have ISIS on the rise. It's transnational because it reflects certain ethnocultural realities and ideological realities that, trans that transcend state borders, the artificial state borders of the post-World War I peace settlement. Now, these disaggregates, how did, how did they Govern. They co opt, the colonial powers co opted uh, minorities. Uh, the, for instance, the French got the Alawites uh, into a special category, developed them into a special category. They composed the bulk of the troop Special du Levant. In other words, they relied on a minority to suppress the will and the practices of a majority. Hence the seeds of mistrust that we cope with today. Now, what I would call this is um, 
constructivist. Constructivism is a theory, it's a name that uh, to me doesn't make a lot of, of sense, but it reflects the overwhelming pull of identity. In other words, are we Shia? Are we Sunni? Who's going to prevail? Because we can't compromise on what is our God-given legacy. How, who can disagree with the divinity? Now, what happened is these concepts, self-serving as they may have been, were deeply held and they were reinforced when they came into conflict with what I can call the other, that is a competitive group which a given community views as antithetical to its own self-realization. And although I'm not talking about the uh, Palestine-Israel question, I mean, I think it's a very good example, although they exist throughout the Middle East. If the Israelis prosper, Palestinians view this as a defeat for themselves. If the Palestinians prosper, the Israelis regard this as a threat to themselves. And they attribute negative views to the other. It's always the other guy's fault, the other guy's responsibility. And because we haven't been successful, it's antithetical to our own self-realization. The fact that we have to contend with this other group, this outside world that wishes us ill. Now, and when conflict arises, we, we ask ourselves, well, why for so long in places like Syria was one government able to control everything? And people did seem to get along, Christian, Shia, Sunni. If you've ever walked the streets of Damascus in the old days, it was rather difficult to tell who was who. But with a start of conflict, whatever its cause, these uh, distinct narratives began to grow. So I remember once a um, Sunni student, I believe at the University of Waterloo when I was here as a guest lecturer, said, well, I married a Shia and we've, we never had any problems. Yet the seeds on a community, on a community basis were there that under a given threat would manifest themselves into uh, antagonism and violence. And that's what we see today. Now fear is a critical component in this mix. When groups become preoccupied with what they see as the threat of marginalization or worse. So in such situations, group identity, hey, we've got something in common. We share certain values, we share a language, we're, we're brothers and sisters. We, 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 we have to protect ourselves, our way of life, our way of thinking. That provides a sense of strength and comfort against demonization and dehumanization which the other party represents. So if you take the case of Iraq with the invasion of the Americans, whereas the minority Sunni had been in control, they were disempowered. The, with the American aim, conscious or not, was to put the Shia in power and ha somehow induce them to govern in a benevolent way, which given the, the attitudes that I've described here, proved to be impossible. Now, once you've dealt with the question of ethno-nationalism, you also have fundamentalism, which flows from the contradiction between the collective memory of the triumph of early Islam and the failure of the Muslim peoples to find sustenance today. In other words, if we could only do it like our ancestors did and be true to the faith and be true to the book, these differences would disappear. 
as I've suggested before, the trouble is defining what's true to the book. And all this is aggravated by a rigid traditionalism and a sense of historic humiliation. The Shia got power in Iraq. They had been traditionally discriminated against in a, a massive way by the Sunni elite. And they had a scores to settle. And they resolved to take advantage of the American presence to institute a new regime based on their own ethno-nationalist and ideological con concepts. Fundamentalists abhor pluralism. They ad advocate instead a return to what they see as the basic tenets of the Koran and Sunnah, bound by a strictly literal interpretation requiring rejection of the inherent corruption they see around them in differing societal belief systems. And this, as I've suggested, has great appeal because it offers a sense of belonging to those feeling themselves disadvantaged and marginalized by modern society. If you can't cope with the present, why not go back to an idealized past? And if you're brutalized enough by the success systems that have gone before you and motivated by a higher cause that justifies any mode of behavior, then I think it's easy to see why violence, retribution, and um, dispossession of the other become the root of your belief system. Now, in terms of uh, liberalism, well, surely we as liberal internationalists, let's say, or neoconservatives or neoliberals, whatever we want to call it, who feel that we have a mission to liberate these traditional societies from their own prison, we have to we think we have to force governments in the region or create governments in the region to be increasingly accountable to their populations. But those who advocate such systems, in my view, uh, neglect the preponderance of negative factors. The lack of any broad-based agreement on the role of the state on the role of citizens and the state. How does the citizen interface with the state? And in many cases, as I've referred to, in terms of the creation of places like Jordan, Israel, the Palestinian territories, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, the very idea of the state itself, should these countries be a state? I'm engaged right now in reading a very lengthy tome on uh, Faisal, the um, first king of Iraq, who tried at the Paris Peace Conference to institute a, an Arab-wide system where the Arabs would govern themselves, the colonialists would leave, Even then, Faisal did not have a very realistic appreciation of the multiplicity of interests and ethnological factors that dominated um, the Arab world. So there was a lack of broad-based agreement on the role of the state as there is today. Now, what happens is overly assertive liberalism, I think, as we see have seen leads to bad policy with calamitous results when, when we confront the ingrained habits of inelastic societies. These societies are very brittle. And people say, well, used to say back in the 70s and 80s, you know, 
Well, Assad and Syria, Saddam Hussein, those regimes never change because they didn't change because they were held together by force. It was like a cinder block construction. But when the explosion came, the entire thing crumbled. And what both the Americans and those proponents of the Arab Spring ignored or perhaps had difficulty accepting the reality of the fact that when you get rid of the main underpinnings of the state, like the Americans did in Iraq, you get rid of the army, you get rid of the security services, you fire or dismiss anybody that's been a, a professional who's been in the Ba'ath Party. Sort of like being in the Communist Party in uh, the old Soviet Union. If you wanted to get ahead, you'd be a member of the Communist Party. So you destroyed those few structures that existed, and then you had this huge vacuum, which this disparate group of peoples and belief systems struggled to, fi to fulfill without any central core idea binding them together. So I think when we look at the Middle East, what we should be doing is focusing on what can in reality be achieved. Because to go beyond this is most often an indulgence, however tempting. It makes us feel good. Well, they should do this. They should do that. If only they would. Because that legitimizes our own belief system, our own set of values of pluralism, of accommodation, of, of a functioning democratic system. But I believe that at a minimum, we have an obligation not to make matters worse than we found them. Through ill-conceived interventions, which leave catastrophe in their wake. As in Iraq and Libya, Libya was the great military success. Look at it today. There was no glue that bound those tribal elements together into a single society. Uh, they fragmented. They went to war with each other over turf, over historic wrong, over religious interpretations. So sometimes what we do is we say, well, as bad as it is, it's going to get better. It's long, it's painful. And we, and we say that because it makes us feel that in the long term, our views will win out. We just have to be more patient. We have to try harder. We don't want to think about the multitude killed, although given the media these days, it's hard not to, or maimed, or displaced. Threatening, for instance, not only Syria itself, but in this case, the very survival of Lebanon and Jordan, which are subject to mass of refugee inflows. 20% of the or larger than that, I would say, I should correct myself, close to 30% of the Lebanese population today, those living in Lebanon, are refugees from Syria. How does a society cope with that influx, particularly one that was largely dysfunctional in the first place? What's going to happen if the overflow of these events results in the demise of the Hashemite monarchy in Jordan, that pillar of defense, of fairness for the Americans, the British, uh, the, the Israelis, the Egyptians, the status quo powers, those that don't want to see change. So you've got a constellation there who have seen what has happened and now have decided Okay, we tried change, didn't work. Let's support the Saudis. Let's support the Gulf states. Let's support the Egyptians. Even if they're brutal, even if they don't accord what we would consider uh, full rights or normal human rights to these individuals, better them than the chaos we see going on up north. <laughs> 
Now, when we look at this, uh, people point to the, for instance, in Iraq, the, the role of women, education for children. The question is not whether these are worthy achievements, which they are, but whether they're sustainable without massive societal transformation. One has to ask repeatedly, at least I do, whether the radical changes envisaged by interventionists are viable in such hostile and misunderstood environments. In other words, you can go into a place like Afghanistan and you can work terribly hard to better the role of women. But when the Taliban takes over again, what's going to happen to those people whose consciousnesses have been raised? I don't think we have any choice but to do it and to try and ensure that there are circumstances that will permit this to progress. But on thinking on the darker side, it's a very risk-fraught picture that emerges. So we're faced with a Hobson's choice uh, governed by ethnicity and ideology. Yeah, who do we side with? Who is worse? Who is better? What's the least evil? It's a zero-sum game. The choice between the old autocracies and their successor entities is not one to be envied. As odious as the old dictators often were. This is interesting. Discrimination against women and minorities, for example, is more pervasive today in Syria than it was during the dictator's heyday. It is not for nothing that the Assad regime in, superior in, in uh, Syria retains support from Alawites, Christians, Druze, Shia, Ismailis, because that regime, as brutal as it was, was the protector of minorities, because it itself was a minority. I think that the yearning for stability provided by the authoritarians seems to many, and certainly in the region, to be increasingly desirable if that's the only viable alternative to chaos. Now, a fellow named Marwan Moasher, who is an academic at the Carnegie Institute, who was a minister when I was ambassador in Jordan, a minister of the Jordanian government, he and other progressives recognize that there's a problem. They show insights into the educational faults of the Arab, uh, the Arab system, not only of rote learning, but of the value and emphasis attached to technical degrees at the university level, at the expense of social sciences which risk in autocratic minds independent thinking on political and social issues. Don't want anybody studying the social sciences. Better to have them build bridges. Moasher maintains you've got to turn away from that. And that pluralist societies which we must strive to create per, uh, will benefit or are the source of uh, such vehicles. Where such views can be contested is their emphasis on what should be done rather than what can be done. Moasha writes, for instance, about the need for viable electoral infrastructure, for leaderships to encourage pluralism, and for them to abandon the concept that diversity means disloyalty. I totally agree, but I have no idea how one is going to get there. And I don't think he does. He says, don't worry, it'll all work itself through. This is catharsis. It's a pretty painful catharsis. He admits that opposition to these pluralistic changes will be substantial and determined. But he offers no 
confrontation, if you like, if I can use that word, with the realities, in my view, on the ground in terms of what people confront in their day-to-day -day lives. Too many people, including policymakers, act as though military force alone will provide solutions. Well, allied air attacks against ISIS, that is the Islamic State, do serve a purpose in degrading and hopefully destroying that organization's reputation, capabilities, and longevity. They will not affect ideological belief systems. You can destroy ISIS, but you won't destroy the ideas behind it. Because those are driven by ethno-national imperatives and the sense of alienation that ISIS represents. Because the military can't address basic human needs for legitimate government, physical security, and social and economic development. ISIS thus being a symptom of cultural and social dysfunction as much as it is a cause of it. I want to give you uh, briefly here before I wind up a couple of examples that come from Iraq. The current uh, fighting in Iraq for the control of uh, Tikrit, uh, Ramadi, and Mosul you could, you could say this is a straight-on confrontation between Shia and Sunni. Not quite so simple. Because the bulk of the fighting forces on the government side are militias trained and officered by Iranian Shia. And they constitute the main protagonists attempting to subdue Sunni-based ISIS domination in the northwest of, of, of Iraq. Why did this happen? It was the work of a corrupt and ineffective government of Riyadh al-Maliki, the previous Iraqi prime minister who disempowered the army by stacking the officer corps with self-seeking Shiite zealots who were paid handsomely for their job. In other words, he fell into the ethno-national trap hook, line, and sinker, and consciously. So that today we see that the current government apparatus in Baghdad is only a shell, and that the Iraqi Prime Minister, Hader al-Abadi, is largely powerless. Not only do you have Shia militias, Iranian officer Shia militias who bear the bulk of the fighting for these towns, against ISIS, which represents at least part of the Sunni community. Those Sunnis are, are in turn caught between the extremism of their, of their ethno-national partners and, the, and violent Shia hostilities. What is now of concern is that these Shia militias are going to massacre Sunnis as they retake turf if they retake turf. So the, these are some of the examples of the tremendous difficulties one has in putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. But these are the challenges we, we've got to address, although many have serious doubts. Now, many think tanks you'll still hear today call for a recommitment to pluralism by leaderships, negotiations on power sharing, coordinated and constructive intervention by other concerned parties. Great stuff, but it's not going to happen because the people that could make it happen don't want it to. We want it to, but we don't have the means or the mechanisms or the capabilities to make it happen. So I don't think there's any immediate way in escaping this quicksand. So I think unprecedented violence and disruption 
is going to be with us for some time. Now, if I were a theoretician and I were asked what could be done, ironically, I'd choose something like the Lebanese model, where each ethnic group or religious group, sure, they have a parliament, sure, they, they have a prime minister and a, and a speaker and a president who are elected. But the reality is that the goods are divvied up within Lebanon by elite speaking for the Shia, mainly Hamas now, for the Sunnis, for the Christians, for the Druze. And these elites decide who gets what, where, and when. So if you could bring leaderships together in a practical, workable way to divide up on behalf of their communities the services the, and meet the needs that their communities have from, from government, many, many, some suggest this might be workable. I hope it would work. I can't see it working. So what we're really left with in terms of what we can do or can't do is really simply to help those that we can. We should help many. We can help a few. And those we can help are the refugees, the displaced, with food, with money, with education, with sustenance. That we can actually do and we can see the results. You could argue that it perpetuates a situation that's unacceptable, but that situation isn't going to, to, to disappear in any event. Whereas this at arm's length activity, dealing with at least some of the victims of the suffering, can alleviate their concern, can give some of them the opportunity to have a better world and a better life. I remember one, one practical example that we had was we set up a program when I was in foreign affairs in Lebanon to offer scholarships to uh, certain uh, Palestinian women from the uh, refugee camps in, in South Lebanon. And uh, it, it wasn't very expensive. And uh, it produced some quite qualified people who, by and large, were able to access at least some of the benefits that we have come to expect. Unfortunately, that was closed for, I guess, ultimately reasons of a balanced budget or, or what have you. But we can't, in closing, I want to say, escape the unprecedented unprecedented violence, but we can make a difference to some of those most at need in the hopes that we can assist governments like Jordan and Lebanon who are trying to cope and absorb the, these people and the refugees themselves on the way to a better life. Thank you. Questions. I'm always in favor of questions. And if there aren't any, then I'll only conclude that I was absolutely right in everything I said <laughs> and absolutely clear in how I said it. Please, to my John, right. John Tennant. Thank you, Michael, for a splendid uh, tour d'horizon. You ended by invoking us to pay some attention to what could be done in Lebanon and Jordan that in a sense uh, remain to a degree apart from a great deal of the chaos that is there. Um, could you talk just a little bit about uh, their vulnerability and strength, the degree to which they are subject to many of these very unfortunate forces? Can we count on them 
uh, is just helping refugees enough to expect that they will be able to withstand what's uh, happening in the area? Okay, one other question can I take? Um, I actually had two questions, so I don't know whether, is that okay or? Okay, so the first question was slightly less relevant to your topic, but I figured make use of an opportunity. I'm actually a student here at the school, and when I started my semester, I had, I guess, uh, dreams of diplomacy in the future, which have slightly diminished, uh, but have not fully died out yet. So I was hoping to ask you, as a diplomat, what you might uh, view to be sort of the tools, the skills that you see um, modern day diplomats needing or requiring to actually excel in the field. And the other question was related to the topic at hand, and I was just hoping to inquire. You spoke a lot about a Middle East that seems to be bound by sort of the specter of its history, and you talked a lot about ethno-nationalism, the resurgence of ethno-nationalism being a huge factor in determining what's the chaos that's going on right now. And I'm just wondering, there's a lot of individuals from the UK, from the, uh, from Europe, from Canada, from the US, who have been venturing back into to the heart of these conflicts that are somewhat removed from the ethno-nationalism that you were talking about. I'm just wondering what you make of them and what their role in this conflict is and whether or not it's actually fundamental to the broader conflict that you were talking about. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me tackle uh, the, the last um, bit first. Of course it's helpful, but the danger is, and I wouldn't discourage it, I would encourage it, but the danger is, I think, that once one has been educated and lived in the West, the danger is one goes back with a bit of a superiority conflict and says, well, we'll teach you, we'll help you. It doesn't always happen by any means. But I think it's very hard to re-immerse oneself into a culture as a, a, essentially a, a, a peacemaker. Partly because I don't think that has the credibility of someone who has lived through it all and, um, and, and um, suffered and has the most urgent need to rectify things. In other words, it's, it's a good thing to do, but uh, is it workable? For instance, after the invasion, American invasion of Iraq, a lot of uh, Iraqi Americans and others went back uh, to help with the reconstruction. I'm not sure they really did. And I'm not sure they were really accepted as we might hope they would have been. On the question of uh, the future of, of refugees, hopefully there will be a period when these people can go back to their homes. But I don't see how one plans or, or uh, takes account of that right now. I think that when we're looking at refugees in, in let's say Jordan or Lebanon, we're looking at people that are by and large going to stay where they are. So let's say that we have a, an internationally endorsed meaningful program to take, for instance, into Canada as well as like-minded countries, a certain number of uh, refugees to give them a home, to give them the freedoms that we, we enjoy here, save them from a fate uh, and, and literally sometimes worse than death. We should do that. But the number that we would affect when I listen to these discussions on, on power and politics around the CBC and, and other media about are we going to take 1,000 or 5,000 or what? this is a drop in the bucket. This is, a, a, without belittling it, a kind of tokenism that makes us feel better about ourselves, but doesn't do anything to solve these longer range problems. So what I'm suggesting, I guess, is that we offer uh, 
them the ability to prosper where they are in the hopes that they may eventually be able to go home or be integrated into the society where they are currently living. It's easy to forget that 60% uh, plus of the uh, Jordanian population is made up of refugees from Palestine. And they were pretty successfully uh, integrated over the years. Now, uh, the task of doing that seems pretty easy compared with the one confronting us now. But I do think we have to start off slowly, start off by doing meaningful and real things, even if our time horizon is necessarily limited and we can't see quite to the end of things the way we would like to, to be more comprehensive or confident in our predictions. I don't know. I don't, know. I don't think we'll be in very good shape in 10 years, but I can't tell you what kind of shape we, we will be in, let alone 20 or 30. As to uh, diplomacy and what skills is necessary after this, I'm a bit perplexed. I, I think anybody looking at the field of diplomacy should look at it in its broadest possible context and not just in the context of government service with the Department of Foreign Affairs here in Canada. Because first of all, the number of uh, opportunities there are to participate are, are quite limited. And the, often nowadays the advice of uh, foreign service officers of the foreign service is not heeded very highly by the government. But there are a good number of NGOs and government-supported agencies, particularly in the United States and Britain, that offer opportunities for people who want to be engaged in meaningful ways in uh, the uh, relief of those suffering most. And it can even extend to a preventative um, options. For instance, I was able to hear a presentation a few weeks ago by a woman that represents a, an organization in the United States that tries to get through the help of parents to children who seem uh, uh, of Islamic uh, heritage, who, who seem uh, very sensitive to what they feel is a need to go back and fight the good fight for true Islam, to try to talk them out of it, to have therapy sessions, to work towards uh, uh, a more rational approach on their part towards the, the problems that are extant and to the degree to which they can be dealt with and the consequences of their going back, the, the consequences of going back to work uh, with ISIS aside from what one, one might assume are not very nice. You're not treated very well there once you do get back, especially if you're a woman. So I, I would say there are lots of opportunities for using problem-solving skills in a international context that deal with some of the human and societal issues that we've been talking about here tonight. And I would encourage anyone that's studying these things to explore very carefully what the range of options are. They may be very, very surprised. And who knows if things change and with experience of, of years within the UN system or in NGOs or what have you, there may be opportunities that arise where the Foreign Service goes looking for you because you have the skills that they need. So I wouldn't turn down a job in the Foreign Service if one were offered to me today, but it wouldn't be necessarily my first priority. I see a question on the screen here. Is developing a more thorough understanding of local context a first, a first step to understanding what is and is not possible in terms of regional change. Uh, that's exactly it. Without that context, you can't do anything. And you can do a lot of harm. There is a, a 
a PBS documentary that's uh, fairly recent on the American experience in Iraq, which uh, is interesting for political junkies, but it's also interesting because it shows you pretty graphically and candidly the series of mistake after mistake after mistake that were made in Iraq that led to the situation that we have today. So that this kind of understanding is essential. If you don't have it, frankly, if I were hiring you for a certain job or going to post you to a certain country, I wouldn't do it. Because without that, you can't achieve much. And you may do more harm than good. Yes. My name is uh, Will Winterfeld. I wanted to make a comment and then have a question. Further to your comment about these kind of random um, acts of kindness, small things that we can do, especially for refugees, uh, MCC, Mennonite Central Committee, and uh, Project Plowshares are putting together something in, I think it's two Sundays from now, where we'll be packing five-gallon pails with uh, all types of supplies for the refugees in um, probably in Syria, maybe in Turkey, I can't remember which camps. But, and that would be open for people to, to participate in. My question is, I don't know if you've read the book by Hirsi Ali, um, it's called Heretic. I don't know if you've had a chance to read that. It's and sitting on my bedside okay. table. <laughs> uh, it's a nice shiny cover. Yeah, uh, it's a very powerful the book. On, the only, uh, the fingerprints on it are my wife's, but I <laughs> bought it with the intention that I would swell myself by reading it. I highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a book written by a vulnerable person uh, coming out of a vulnerable state, but her, one of her premises is that um, uh, nothing can, very little can happen at this stage without a reformation in Islam in relationship to violence. I wonder if you could, uh, having not touched the book, yeah. maybe you, you could comment on that? Yeah. Well, I certainly can say that uh, during my periods of service, in the Arab world, I did not find uh, Palestinians, Egyptians, Jordanians as a whole radical extremists uh, devoted to a, a purist interpretation, if you like, of Islam to the exclusion of other things. That's beyond my experience. But it does exist. And those people who advocate it and are willing to die for it can be very effective in disrupting or destroying a system. Just look at the numbers of ISIS activists that are, were able to take over Fallujah, for instance. What, a couple of thousand? And weigh that against the equipment of the uh, Iraqi army, the amount of effort that the Americans have put into it the assistance of these militias, etc. cetera, that, that, that tells you how tenacious uh, they can be. So I, I question whether a kind of wholesale reformulation of Islam is, is necessary to as, as achieve pluralism and accommodation. Uh, that said, uh, does she deal with how one does it? Which seems to me the core of the matter. I have a lot of great ideas, but my God, I can't just realize them. I, I just want to go on one of those Danube cruises so badly this summer. <laughs> but I can't figure out how to do it. I can blame the government for not giving me a significant enough pension, but or my over, own overspending on other things, but I can't do it. And uh, I don't mean to be totally facetious, but uh, uh, what one actually can achieve is very, very important. It doesn't make for as exciting reading as uh, other options, but in terms of really solving a problem like female genital mutilation in Egypt, for instance, um, that has to be done slowly. Um, I, I'd like it to be done 
yesterday, today, and what have you. But when I was there for four years, I, the government was making slow process, but it couldn't have been done without the help of the government. So these things all have to be put in terms of a local and real context for them to be effective. Yes? Thank you for your remarks this evening. Uh, I'm curious how Iran figures into your analysis, and in particular, I'm curious how you assess the prospects of the agreement that might materialize between the United States and Iran with regard to their nuclear program? Well, there's no doubt that the Iranians see themselves as an injured party in terms of the Persian Empire and the role that they should have, they see legitimately have, in, the, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. So anything that gives them a, 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 a foot up will lead them to exert themselves in places like Iraq, in places like the Gulf where they can, in Lebanon, in Syria. They will feel empowered and legitimized in a sense. In terms of the actual, and this is, could be the subject of a, an entirely uh, different uh, lecture, I, I'm puzzled by the fact that there is a feeling that an agreement between the P5 plus one, mainly the Americans, and Iraq that uh, nucle nuclear weapons not be developed is viewed as a threat because if there's no agreement, they're going to, they certainly will do it. So um, my, without knowing any of the details, I would tend to give the benefit of the doubt to Barack Obama. And I'd like to ex examine the details in, 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 uh, with some care uh, once they become available. Uh, but I think an ideological system that, that we have in the West or that American Republicans have, let's say, for instance, that somehow the best thing is just to bomb them to destroy those nuclear sites, is not going to ultimately solve the problem. It's going to embitter them, lead them to more drastic action. Uh, and uh, a region that's at greater harm. You know, if you look at the problems that Iran suffers from today, in terms of their own economy, in terms of the fragmentation of their society, in terms of uh, their, e even their ambitions in terms of Iraq and the Gulf, they, they're beset by so many problems. I would be very, very surprised if they were to uh, decide, even if they were to develop nuclear weapons, which I don't think they are likely to do, if they would launch them at Israel. I find this uh, it would be the complete antithesis of the ra uh, uh, rational actor thesis. They would have to be irrational because I can tell you, having lived in, in uh, Israel for nine years on three successive occasions, successive occasion, uh, if the Iranians were to attack uh, Israel with nuclear weapons, Tehran would cease to exist. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but that is my view. Another question here on the board. If policymakers in 1919 Paris were ignorant of Middle Eastern realities, are today's policymakers exploring and understanding current realities any better? Um, not necessarily. I think in, in principle, yeah, there, the, the, these, in 1919, we were still dealing with the end of the imperial era. Um, now we're not. One has to try to understand why people react the way they do. But there's an easy tendency to fall back into old habits, like the guy that they hired, the Republican government of the Bush administration, from Michigan to go to Baghdad and rewrite the traffic regulations. <laughs> and he used Michigan as a model. That shows to me that perhaps we haven't advanced as far as we would like to. <laughs> and and we, we laugh about it today, and I do too. But my God, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 
That was certainly the reality. Not so many years ago. Read, if you can find it, the Project for the New American Century, which was the Bible for American neoconservatives. A lot of important people wrote that document. Uh, probably not many of them would be willing to admit that they were part and parcel of the theoretical underpinnings of American-inspired revisionism of Arab state systems. Yes. Uh, hi, Bupinder Singh Lidar. Thanks for your. We know each other. Best we do. <laughs> Um, whose baby was originally ISIS? Not who was adopted it, but whose was it? Well, it was a split, uh, uh, a breakaway group from Al Qaeda. That may have been uh, very much a function of uh, personal rivalries, struggle for power. And although things may be changing, at least at its inception and until first, uh, fairly recently, Al-Qaeda's uh, modus vivendi was uh, not to establish a caliphate, but really to destroy those who insulted and degraded and colonized the Muslim peoples, the Americans, the Israelis, and what have you. The difference is that ISIS and that may be, this may be changing. Uh, main intent, and I believe it will stay that way for some time, is to establish and control territory, to actually create a state and provide <coughs> education, and provide uh, governance, provide all the f facilities that a normal state would provide. Hence, Although a number of would-be terrorists in the West say, I support Al-Qaeda and what have you, doesn't mean that they've been recruited by Al-Qaeda, that they've been sought by Al-Qaeda to perpetrate terror acts abroad. As I say, that may be changing. There's some indication that it is. But nevertheless, Al-Qaeda has never advocated the creation of a single caliphate. Uh, in any near-term future. And uh, that is the self-definition, if you like, of the ISIS system of the Islamic State. Its very name says so. Yes. Yeah, uh, hello, James Skidmore from Waterloo. I'm, I'd like to press you a little more on what you think Canada's role should be, because it's gone back and forth a little bit in the past, um, say, 10 or 15 years, and mm -hmm. I'm and I understand the point you made about, you know, the, um, well, two points that you made resonated with me. First of all, there's, in one, on one hand, there's very little one can do in terms of, say, the refugee situation. Quibbling over a few thousand refugees here or there isn't really going to solve a situation that's affecting hundreds of thousands. But on the other hand, the, um, the, the other point you made about, you know, humanitarian efforts, et cetera, in, in reference to the diplomacy question, does that, you know, again, is that really then doing enough? And so I'm wondering, well, what should Canada be doing? Should we be fighting ISIS or not? Should we be um, involved in the region in any fashion? Or should we, you know, just pull back completely? Should we be, should we be um, so involved in Israeli uh, affairs as we've become? Or should we be pulling back there as well? So I'd be, I'd be curious about your opinions on that. Well, I, I think... There's a belief here, I, I, I don't want to be partisan about this, but it seems to me Mr. Harper is, tends to be a neoconservative. <laughs> and that therefore the resort to arms is, it comes easier to him than it would come to others. That said, I have to qualify it slightly, I, I did not oppose the decision to send Canadian aircraft to, to, uh, to Syria and subsequently to, to Jordan, simply because I felt that whether the basic ideas of 
ISIS would continue in one form or another. The, the crimes were so unmitigated and horrific that if one could destabilize that organization enough, throw it off balance enough, force it to retreat, that that would have achieved some good. So I do think we have a role there, but again, I would put very heavy emphasis on uh, diplomatic action and on humanitarian relief and less so on uh, military or so-called hard options. You know, we used to have an embassy in Tehran. The Americans did not have one. You know who was the most sought after person respecting the Middle East, Canadian, in, uh, in Washington? Our ambassador, Canadian ambassador. Because he was on the ground and they wanted an appreciation from him of what actually was happening. That kind of intermediary role can be very, very important. So I, I fundamentally disagree with an approach saying you do it our way or we walk, or you do it our way or we bomb. I, I think there, there are very useful ways that perhaps are not all that dramatic in terms of what's going to be on the news that night, but it can be very, very meaningful. So just to develop that a bit further, you, you can have uh, great announcements. We're going to do this, we will not stand for that, et cetera, et cetera. But what, what does that really change in terms of the people that we purport to be concerned about? Whereas if so, some of these other activities that I'm talking about, you know, they're, they're good for a press release or an announcement or what have you, or a remark in the house, and then one doesn't hear about them. But that work may be going, go, going on for years. In uh, work that I've been involved in on the uh, future governance status of the old city of Jerusalem, now it doesn't look like anything is going to come of the negotiations, but we've developed a very, very detailed scenario for uh, a meaningful governance option based on the needs of both Palestinians, Israelis, Muslims, and Jews. Our chair of the uh, refugee working group, which has long since ceased to function, uh, dealing with Palestinian refugees and uh, their fate in the event of a peace agreement. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there. No one can say that on that issue that it hasn't been thoroughly explored. And I think it's to our credit that uh, it has been. Uh, that said, the, the fact that it doesn't look like there's gonna be an agreement is fine, but if you're looking to uh, uh, bat a thousand or whatever you do in baseball, it, it, don't look at the Middle East. If you're looking to be successful nine times out of 10 or five times out of 10 or even one times out of 10, uh, don't look at the Middle East because you're not going to find it. That doesn't mean it's not worth the effort. And then one doesn't almost have an obligation, a moral kind of obligation to try to help no matter how little it seems given the intractability of the problems the one's dealing with. Thank you. A few uh, quick comments, and I have a couple of thank yous. First, I want to thank the uh, Bosley School of International Affairs for helping to bring uh, Michael Bell to Waterloo uh, for this event tonight, and also for a full day of activities at the school tomorrow where Michael, out of the goodness of his heart, and maybe a lunch and a dinner and a belief in education, is helping uh, CG graduate students who are master's students at the Bosley School to present their, uh, the policy briefs they've been working on and critique them. Uh, so thank you to the school, and also thank you to you, Michael, especially for your lecture this evening. Uh, and for all the work that you're doing here. You know, it's very, it's very human uh, to want to solve problems. And to say a problem 
may not be solvable uh, in the near term can easily be mistaken for despair or nihilism or giving up. But I, what I take from your remarks tonight is that if we stop banging our heads against a wall and uh, thinking we can soon impose Western liberal democ dem democracies and social values on factions and ideologies that aren't quite ready for them, then perhaps that will free us up, uh, free up our energy, our resources, and our attention to address problems we can solve, including alleviating uh, some of the terrible suffering that these conflicts are creating, helping the refugees, and then also not losing our focus on the long, longer-term diplomatic efforts that happen quietly in the background. Uh, so that is indeed a very human approach, and for sharing these insights informed by your many years of service to Canada in the Middle East, we thank you once again. The edited video of tonight's live webcast will be posted to the CG website and in the coming weeks we invite you to join us for these events at the CG Auditorium. Uh, next Wednesday, May 27th, John Fullerton, the founder and president of the Capital Institute, will speak to the CG audience on reimagining capitalism. On June 8th, we'll be screening the documentary Red Lines. The movie follows two young Syrian activists who launch a plan for bringing democracy to Syria. And finally, we invite you to join us on June 17th for our annual media panel, uh, wrapping up our season of public events. Uh, this is co-sponsored by the Waterloo branch of the Canadian International Council. And this year, we'll hear about the need for Canadian reporters' eyes on foreign news. Uh, and the speakers will include the top news executives of Canada's most influential media, the Globe and Mail, CBC, CTV, the Toronto Star. Be sure to register online for the CG Events newsletter to get information on all of our upcoming events. Thank you for joining us this evening and have a safe journey home.